Welcome to CBMC's English Worship Service. And whether you're watching at normal times or even watching weeks from now, let us set aside this time as sacred time. And Revelation 7 verse 11 says, They fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us worship the Lord now. Don't let 
your heartbeat trouble Hold your head up, I don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you Take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where hell comes from And you can find all of our announcements at en.cbmcla.org slash bulletin. And so here are a few things to be aware of. If you're interested in getting baptized around Easter or you're interested in becoming a member of our church, one of the prerequisites is to take our annual Life Series class. And it's three weeks and it starts on February 7th. If you're interested, email me at english at cbmcla.org and uh, we can work out the details with you. So, as we approach God's Word, let us be reminded that God speaks and things happen. He says, let there be light, and there was light. And he says to the dead person, come, and there's resurrection. Theologically, God chooses to reveal himself through speech, 
which is why we value the sermons and our Bible lessons. This is our time where God speaks to us. So let's declare together what we believe about the scriptures. Now to 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that this is how you operate. You speak. You are a God that wants to manifest himself through your word. And we pray that as we digest this and study it, God, you would speak into our very own souls and cause things to happen. And we pray now that you would work through this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll recall the Dodgers winning the World Series last October, but I want to take you back to 2016 when the Dodgers still hadn't won a championship since 1988. They made it to the playoffs three consecutive years, but every single time they didn't advance very far into the playoffs, and so everyone was frustrated. They parted ways with manager Don Mattingly, and they hired Dave Roberts. What would Dave Roberts do differently? He said the number one goal is for us to create an unbreakable bond within this group where no distractions get us away from staying together. Because if we have that, then everything else will take care of itself. What did Dave Roberts do during spring training? He gave everyone unconventional projects to do. 8.45 a.m. was the daily team meetings at the clubhouse, and some players had to find out the hometown for each of the other players, and then they had to make a giant map of where that would be. He made social media hermits like Rich Hill post an Instagram account for the very first time. When Cody Bellinger was a rookie, his assignment was to reach 10,000 Twitter followers by the end of spring training. He had to give a presentation with updates in front of his whole team, which prompted teammates to come up with the hashtag Cody Love on Twitter. Players were then assigned to act as news reporters to a local rodeo, and Justin Turner ended up paying for all these outfits. Players were required to go to coffee with Doc where they sat down with members of the training staff in the front office. You see, baseball teams, they're full of new faces every single year. And so Dave Roberts said this, which comes first, winning or chemistry? Last year we fell back eight games and, and we came back because of chemistry. Spring training is big because that's when chemistry starts. So the question that I'm asking you, which comes first, winning or chemistry? And that's a question that also applies to the church. Many live like unity is irrelevant. Yeah, it's important. People will say that out loud. But when you look at the actions of what we do, you can tell who believes in church unity and who really doesn't. We're going through a series now for 2021 where we're learning together how to be the community that God intended us to be. You heard last week from our senior pastor what together looks like. You heard, for those of you that went to the core meeting yesterday, uh, what some of the plans are for us to move together as a church for 2021. Today, you're going to see part two of our text in Colossians chapter 3. And so two weeks ago, we asked the simple question, how do we come together? And the answers were this. Number one, you take away standard social divisions. Two, we dress ourselves not with status, but with character. Three, we bear and give grace. And then fourth, we dress with love. This week, we're going to give four more answers, which are going to overlap with some of those from two weeks ago. But again, the question is still the same, and that is, how do we come together? And for those of you that are watching who haven't made a commitment yet to follow after Jesus, one of the benefits is that after you decide to follow Jesus, God immediately puts you into a community called the church. And it's unlike any other community you've ever been a part of. Every other community usually devolves into promoting itself. The community of this church, it evolves by promoting God, not ourselves. And the offer is also extended to you to become part of God's adopted family. So how do we come together? Let's start off verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. So what is this peace of Christ? It comes from the Hebrew word shalom, and it could mean harmony or health or prosperity. But what's important here is the word rule, because it's not the normal word for rule that we have in Greek. This word is an unusual word, and it comes 
from the word judge, brabius. It's a rare word in the Bible. It's first used when a judge has to decide arguments, but it changed into an umpire who had to decide between athletes or combatants. So pay attention. How does the church make judgments? It says by peace. So think about how we make judgments. In human terms, you see in the Myers-Briggs temperament, uh, it breaks down decision making it down into thinkers on one side or feelers on the other side. So thinkers, they like to find the truth and the principle. They like to analyze pros and cons. They like to be consistent and logical in how they make decisions. Feelers, on the other hand, they do it differently. They make decisions by weighing points of view from all these other different people. And they're concerned with the values of what's best for the people. So get this, from this passage, if the church is to make decisions, and we're not talking about other scenarios like work or family decisions, we're talking strictly with the church here. If it is to make decisions, then we need to take into consideration the peace, the shalom of the congregation. I was interning at a church in Colorado, and the senior pastor was 65 years old. He worked for the church for 25 years, and he was loved by the congregation. Unfortunately, he was also diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and he was pretty ineffective from the pulpit. He also had nothing saved for retirement. The elders had a tough choice to make. Do we force him into retirement, uh, but he needed to work? Or do we keep him employed, but then his health would be a problem in his leadership? They chose the path that, in my opinion, brought about the most peace. They dropped him down to part-time for a few years. They helped set up his finances at the expense of the church. And they offered a stipend into retirement. And, and I thought that that brought about shalom in the church. And this is what's going to drive some of you people crazy, especially if you're type A, because yes, it's inefficient. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's illogical. But churches are called to make decisions by the Spirit and what makes for peace. So which comes first, winning or chemistry? Now, this decision-making with peace needs to be in tension with the following other practices. So let's keep reading. And be thankful. Smack in the middle of these unity practices is the command to be thankful. And to me, it wouldn't seem obvious that being thankful leads to unity. But, but then I think about this. People who aren't grateful, they're usually the ones that have poor relationships uh, in comparison with those that are grateful. Lack of gratitude causes division in relationships, whereas gratitude causes unity. Why is that? We've mentioned this before, the Hebrews didn't have a word for thanks. And so by the time Greek became the, the written language, the Bible used the word Eucharisto for thanks. Um, why does the church call communion the Eucharist? Here's a side note, because Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. So even Jesus is thankful. But Eucharisto is broken up into you, which means good, and Charisto, which means grace. So thankfulness in the Greek is connected to grace, which is why in Italian they say thanks with grazie, or in Spanish with gracias. Thus, gratitude is an acknowledgement of grace, and the more thankful you are, the more gracious you are. The more gracious you are, the more together we become. So unity happens when you get a group of people together who think that they don't deserve gifts, but they're thankful and they're gracious. So think about this. Have you ever seen unity from a group of individuals who are entitled together? Now, one of the best practices you can do is to write thank you notes. Um, this week, Biden said that the president, in referring to Trump, the president wrote a very generous letter. The president uh, wrote a very generous letter. I have, it's because it was private, I will uh, not talk about it until I talk to him, but uh, it was generous. And those were gracious words to, about Trump. And if you know how to write thank you notes, whether in a card or an email or a text, you will make yourself more competitive in your career. Uh, you will demonstrate grace to your marriages and to your families and to your children. And you will make the church also more united. Now, if you grew up like I did, no one taught you how to write thank you cards. My parents just 
told me to just say thank you to people, which I found later in life that it wasn't sufficient enough. There's an art to thanks, and, and this comes from Bruce Wilkinson called the three E's. It, it says expose, emote, or expect. You can also look at this as a past, present, or future. This method is going to be much more powerful than a simple thank you in words. So here's what you're gonna do in three to four sentences. If you expose, you're going to say, you just did this, and then you start listing off all the behaviors or the accomplishments that the other person did. Way more powerful than just saying, good job, or you're such a good so-and-so. Uh, those are empty phrases without actually detailing someone else's contributions. The second step is simple. You're going to emote, and you're gonna say, this made me feel Fill in the blank, loved, hopeful, joyful. Other people want to know that their contributions made other people feel good. And the third step is the secret sauce. This is the most powerful part. You write, I believe you are becoming or growing into and fill in the blank. Maybe an impactful manager, a strong woman of God, or a leader by example. What can that person become with God's help? And what you'll do is you're acting as a visionary for that person. You're able to see something in the future of what that person could become and it brings that hope. And that would really take your thank you to a whole different level. Now think about this. What would happen if our church started doing these three E's and started giving thanks to one another in a whole different way, a more meaningful way, a more graceful way? In practice number seven, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Well, how can we come together? Practice number seven, the word must live and dwell in us by correcting and instructing one another with the word of Christ. Now note that the word dwelling, it's an authority word. If you live in someone's house, you submit yourself to that person's authority. And so I tell my kids all the time, my house, my rules. If you don't like my rules, get a job, you can move out. We cannot have unity without truth. And that is a big mistake many people make about unity. So of course, our Lord, Jesus was full, as John 1.14 says, grace and truth. It tells us that Jesus was perfectly balanced with both of those. One guy said that grace without truth is meaningless. Truth without grace is just plain mean. Grammatically speaking, if God's word is to live in us, then we're going to be able to teach and admonish or warn one another. Here's what happens when we have grace without truth, when the word does not dwell in us. We become our own source of what is right and wrong. When King Saul disobeyed God's word and then he went with his own gut feeling and making decisions, 1 Samuel 15, 23 says that for rebellion is the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. Ed Stetzer is a former pastor who turned into a Christian research analyst. And one of the trends that everyone has noticed over the last few decades is that the mainline church attendance has just plummeted. We're talking about Episcopalian, Lutheran, some Presbyterian, some Methodists. Stetzer predicted that those mainline denominations only have about 19 Easter's left before they're dead. What's the cause of this? Stetzer wrote, over the past few decades, some mainline Protestants have abandoned central doctrines that were deemed offensive to the surrounding culture. Jesus literally died for our sins and rose from the dead, or the view of the authority of the Bible, or the need for personal conversion and more. So if the authority of the Bible isn't dwelling in the church, we only have so many Easter's left before we ourselves are also dead too. And, and this is why the word of God is central to our worship service. This is why we care about the proclamation and the teaching lessons. And a united church requires more than just sermons. It requires individuals to live and to breathe in the scriptures on a daily basis, to eat this word. And so when you are forsaking the Bible, when you haven't touched it for days or months, the consequence is that you have little to offer to this church. The church needs your teaching. The church needs your admonishment and your correction. And the church's unity depends on you to dwell in God's word. Practice number eight is a church that worships together with grace. 
singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, there are three different words here. First, you have the Psalms, which would have clearly meant that the Psalms in the Old Testament. Second, you have hymns, which are not the hymns in the hymnal that we use. Hymns were Greek poems of praise to their gods or their, their mighty heroes. It's, it's poetry. Third, the spiritual songs, it's an all-encompassing term. But remember the point here. How does a church come together? It's not necessarily just those three things. It is about singing with thankfulness. Or it's really the word grace, charis again. For a second, notice how many times charis is in this section. You're going to see four variants in four verses. So if we're full of grace in worshiping the Lord, we're naturally going to overflow with grace towards one another. Look at it another way. The opposite attitude of grace is entitlement. So if I worship with entitlement that, that I deserve something from God and God ought to bless me, if I'm full of entitlement and worshiping the Lord, I'm naturally going to overflow with entitlement towards everyone else around me. Psychologists tell us that entitled people, they, they have an exaggerated sense of self-importance. They, they lack understanding of other people's needs or their wants. They, they rarely compromise and they don't accept others as equals. And so how does a church full of entitled people come together? You see that it doesn't. Early on in the development of artificial intelligence, computer scientists put 10 judges uh, in front of computers where they were typing and conversing with someone. And they were asked afterwards, were you communicating with a human or with a piece of software? The program that fooled all the judges, they won a $100,000 prize. But there was also another prize that went to the human that were able to convince the judges that they indeed were human. And so they told the humans, you must work very hard to convince the judges that you're human. You shouldn't have any trouble doing that because you are human. One year, the winner was Charles Platt. And how did he convince judges he was human? It wasn't his mastery of English or his vocabulary. He said, I was rated the most human of all by being moody, irritable, and obnoxious. This is who we are as humans. We're moody, we're irritable, and obnoxious. It's a sign of our own internal entitlement and our lack of grace. Thanksgiving is the antidote to our sinful drive of entitlement. Let's go back to the three E's for a second. And if you were observant, you'll notice that this is also a simple way to deepen your Thanksgiving prayers to the Lord. This method can be found in Thanksgiving prayers in the Bible. Let's take a look at Psalm 34 for a second. Verse 4, it says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Well, what is the psalmist doing there but exposing? And then these emotes in verse 5, those who look to him are radiant. Verse 10, there's the expectation that those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So how do you worship with grace? Well, you expose the things God's done for us, and then you vocalize or you emote uh, the things about this. You don't want to be silent, but the Bible tells us to raise a shout, to lift up our voice, to raise a hand, and then raise an expectation, too, that God has already declared things that have been foreordained. If you worship with grace, you will bless your church with grace. So there you have it. Eight overlapping ways how our church can come together. And, and many of these practices do not have to be done when we're together. You can do this in, during quarantine and during the shutdown. So my question back to you, which comes first, winning or chemistry? My hope is that you understand that you can't win here at this church unless we are doing this together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray that our church be one, and especially when we can't gather together, when we are separated. God, may you make us a church full of grace. May we be able to be thankful for one another and for you. May we worship you with grace because of the good things you have done in our lives. And may we be a people where the word of Christ dwells in us richly. God, bind us together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed be 
conclude with a benediction and so invite you if you have someone in the room with you to lay a hand on that person and let's say this out loud together 2 Corinthians 13 14 the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all well we hope you have a great rest of your weekend we thank you for tuning in God bless you